It is so good to be gathered together across boundaries, across differences. We are not all these separate islands, but we are one in God. However isolated or hopeless or scarce we may feel, however much we may feel like there's not enough or that we're not enough, we are stronger together. When we come together in community, we make a wholeness in our world that is desperately needed. However deep the divisions in our world can feel, let us come together today on World Communion Sunday and practice a new way of being. I invite you to stand for our opening hymn, number 724, God of Earth and Altar. Please be seated. I want to welcome all of us to worship this morning. It's wonderful that we have an opportunity to worship together in this space on World Communion Sunday. All over the world this morning, this afternoon, this evening, Christians will be breaking bread with one another and reaching out to others in the world with peace, a desire for reconciliation, love, and justice. I want to invite those of you who are sitting close to the friendship pads to simply pick one up and pass it down the aisle and uh, fill in the information you wish to share with us and then back again. It's good for you to be in touch with us, especially if you're new this morning. If this is your first visit with us, we'd love to know you. We'd love to know anything about you that you would like to share uh, on our friendship pads, and we welcome you to this time of worship, service, and praise. I'd also like to welcome those who are with us on the webcam this morning. It's great to have you here. There are joy and concern cards in each one of your pews. Will you kindly pick one up if you have a joy or a concern that you would like to share with the pastors or members of this church? And fill it in and drop it in the offering plate as it goes by you this morning. As I've said, it is a very special morning in congregations around the world, and we're celebrating the specialness of this day with Reverend Robert Chase, who is with us this morning as our guest preacher. 
Bob is the founding director of Intersections, and this is a global initiative, an interfaith venture based in New York City, a uh, activity organization that brings people with divergent perspectives and life experiences together in the hopes of forging common good and building strategies to promote peace, justice, and reconciliation in our world. I think it's fascinating to hear that Bob has been in the past few years in and out of work in Pakistan for different times. Bob and I will be at the door to greet you following worship this morning. We'd love to greet you by name and in person, so simply uh, come through the line. It will be great to meet you. The flowers this morning and the decorations, these beautiful peace cranes, I don't know if you remember these from years past, and the gorgeous flowers celebrate the marriage of Rebecca Kreben Coates and Clinton Muldoon. Rebecca actually made, I think, about 500 of those. I think there are a thousand there. They were married uh, in our sanctuary yesterday afternoon. Just a reminder that this week we are collecting for our Neighbors in Need offering. Your donation supports the work of the United Church of Christ, Justice and Witness Ministries. This year they're focusing on education and literacy programs as a way to lift people out of poverty. Simply mark uh, that this is a Neighbors in Need offering in, on your envelope and drop it in uh, the offering plate as it goes by you this morning. Well, don't forget that the Cellar Thrift Shop is open uh, following worship today, and it's open with a very special um, uh, activity. The Cellar Thrift Shop wants to let you know that there are all kinds of Halloween costumes down there. So if you're thinking about that scary day, I'd invite you to drop by the Cellar Thrift Shop this morning after worship. Associate Conference Minister Drew Nettinga is worshiping with us this morning. Drew, could, we, could you stand so we might greet you? He is here in order to help assist us in the search and call process for our next senior minister search, and he will answer questions after worship this morning in the large assembly. We'll take a special moment at the end of this morning's worship to recognize Kelly Ryan's ministry with us. This is her last Sunday with us as our youth, uh, as our young adult coordinator. And there's cake. FCCB loves to eat cake. So let us eat cake following worship this morning in celebration of Kelly's ministry with us. The Middle Ages, I love this name. Is, a, is hosting a costume party on Saturday evening, October 18. Stop by the Cellar Thrift Shop before you go to the costume party. And I uh, would like to uh, invite all of you who are in the Middle Ages, 40s to 50-ish, uh, to come see Rachel Bauman uh, for more information. We'd like to take a moment this morning to recognize Lorenzo Lanillo. Lorenzo, where are you? I haven't yet located you. There you are. Please stay standing while I recognize and say thanks to you. We want to note a transition that has happened in Lorenzo's life. Lorenzo is leaving as our youth program coordinator. He's uh, leaving so that he may take full employment in an architecture firm, which is what you got your degree in. And we are so grateful to you, Lorenzo, for all the ways that you serve this congregation, not only as our youth uh, uh, ministries coordinator, but you have been brilliant in that job this past year, and you've given us, I think, the strong roots that we need to continue in this ministry. We're so grateful to you. This is not goodbye, but this is an acknowledgement of all the wonderful work that you have done with us and with our youth over the past year. We love you. Next week is another special Sunday in our congregation. Jakata Imani, who is the director of the Center for Spiritual and Social Transformation at Pacific School of Religion, will be preaching at 9 o'clock in the large assembly. At 10 o'clock, there is the amazing and wonderfully fun blessing of the animals. So bring your pets to the large assembly and have them be blessed. And Rachel will be preaching at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. We lift up our prayers this morning for Bernice Brousset, 
who is recovering from surgery after a fall. She's doing well. Uh, request your prayers and cards. Also prayers for Barbara Beck and Allie Beck and the death of Barbara's father, Les Peterson, on September 30th. Continued prayers for these among us who are in need of them. For Mitzi McKenna and Jean Houston, Chris Hamill, Liz McBride, and Alice Bonseller. And may God hold with you those that you are lifting up this morning in prayer. And will you continue with me? We'll take a deep breath and move into this time of confession. Please let us pray together. You are the God who is simple, direct, clear with us and for us. You have committed yourself to us. You have said yes to us in creation, yes to us in our birth, yes to us in our baptism, yes to us in our awakening this day. But we are of another kind, more accustomed to perhaps, maybe, we'll see, left in wonderment and ambiguity. We live our lives not back to your yes, but out of our endless perhaps. So we pray for your mercy this day, that we may live yes back to you. Yes with our time, yes with our money, yes with our strength and with our weakness. Yes to our neighbor, yes and no longer perhaps. In the name of your enfleshed yes to us, even Jesus, who is our yes into your future. Amen. And with the words of that beautiful song, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, from the depth of my heart to the bottom of my soul, I say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. In Christ we know there is always a yes because we are given new life. The old has gone away, the new is before us, and we are freed, always freed, to live fully in the present. We are free to love.
invite the children to join me up on the chancel right here. You guys can come up and sit up here, up top with me. Hey guys, so we've got this big basket here, and what are what do all these things have in common? What are what are they? Bread. Yeah, they're they're different kinds of bread. And what sort of things do we need for bread? What do you need to make bread? Flour. flour. You need to Dough. cut the wheat to make flour. Do you're and stepping back. Seeds. Water, seeds. Nice, I like it. Yeast. Yeast. Totally. Yeah. All of, yes, absolutely. There are lots of different kinds of bread here. And there's so many different sorts of things that go in here, especially with these breads, because you're right, there's some basic things, there's some flour, some water, but then there's also seeds and egg and honey. And there, have you ever thought about all the people who are behind these things? You know, the people, like you said, who cut the wheat to make the flour. There are all these people behind what we eat all these different stories. And yeah, and they help us out too. And I think that the way that we can make bread, because as you guys have said, one of the most important things about all these ingredients is that you put them together. And when you mix them together, that's when they become life-giving. And yummy, absolutely. And I think that our lives, our church, our world, we're kind of like that bread where there are all these different individual pieces, but when we come together, we make something new, and we're transformed together. And that's something that's life-giving for us and for the whole world. So will you guys pray with me? Holy God, who gives us our daily bread, we thank you for all that you provide all the ways that you nourish and sustain us, and all the ways that you encourage us to do the same for others. Amen. All right, so you guys can go ahead to Sunday school and go out the door right there. <laughs> and I invite all of you to stand and pass the peace of Christ together. Today's passage from the Old Testament comes from Deuteronomy 28, 11 to 14. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give you. The Lord will open for you his rich storehouse, the heavens, to give the rain of your land in its season and to bless all your undertakings. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be only at the top and not at the bottom if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I am commanding you today by diligently observing them 
And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I am commanding you today, either to the right or to the left, following other gods to serve them, how good and life-giving are the commandments of God. And this from the book of John, from the message version, a little lesson about sheep. And Jesus is speaking in this story. Let me set this before you as plainly as I can. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen, instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good. A sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him, and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he gets them all out, he leads them, and they follow because they're familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. Jesus told this simple story. They had no idea what he was talking about. So he tried again. I'll be explicit then. I am the gate for the sheep. All those others are up to no good. Sheep stealers, every one of them. But the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Anyone who goes through me will be cared for, will freely go in and out and find pasture. A thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you this morning. Both Phil and I and Pat and I go back more years than any of us would care to remember and imagine, but they're good friends. And yet this is the first time I've been in your sanctuary worshiping with you, and so I thank you for the invitation to be here, and it is an honor to share in worship with you. I have three distinct tasks this morning, so we need to get about them quickly. The first first is to preach on your theme that you've been dealing with over the past several weeks, the theme of inequality. The second is to inform you about the organization that I work for, which is called Intersections International, which is a permanent initiative of the Collegiate Church of New York. And the third is to speak a word or two about the work that we're, speak a word or two about the work we're doing in Pakistan. So let's see if we can do all three of those things. But to start, will you join with me in a word of prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. In the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, we read, as was read a few minutes ago, the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground. It is then God's intention that we have enough, more than enough, in fact, and that creation will provide us with all we require. The message, the translation that Phil read from this morning, uses the word lavish. God will lavish upon you. Don't you love that term? And yet we live in a world of fear and foreboding about the limits of what we have and what our future will hold. The morning headlines are replete with dire economic forecasts and whole careers 
are built upon advice as to how to build one's assets into a comfortable future. Indeed, if you look at the world's population, the statistics can be overwhelming. At least 80% of humanity lives on less than $10 a day. The richest 20% account for three-quarters of the world income, while the poorest 40% accounts for only 5%. According to UNICEF, 22,000 children die each day due to poverty. About 72 million children of primary school age in the developing world are not in school, and 57% of those are girls. And yet less than 1% of what the world spends every year on weapons could put every child into school. And in the U.S., according to the Census Bureau, income inequality between the richest and poorest Americans grew to its widest extent in 2012 as the census recorded 46.2 million people living in poverty. That's 46.2 million. From 1992 to 2007, the top 400 earners in the U.S. saw their income increase 392%, while the income of the other 99 remained flat, growing by only two-tenths of 1%. Place on top of this the recent threats of Ebola in Africa and now in the U.S. and the mysterious and terror virus that is sapping the breath of children and perhaps paralyzing them and the horrifying and grotesque practices of ISIS and other wanton terrorists and the questions, question how do we live faithfully in such a time as this becomes more than a mere academic exercise? How do we counter the narrative of fear with a message of hope and confidence? How can we rediscover our own generous hearts? How can we live out Christ's promise to bring life and bring it abundantly when we are so consumed with our own survival? I stood in a room in Islamabad, surrounded by 200 Pakistanis, men in long beards and traditional dress, women in chadors and hijabs. The vast majority had never met an American. And I was there to explore bringing an interfaith group of religious leaders to Pakistan to be in dialogue with our Pakistani counterparts and I was addressing the group on the campus of the International Islamic University as to why I thought this was a good idea. And someone from the crowd rose and said, I know that your scripture, he was referring to John 14, 6, says that Jesus is the only way and that no one comes to the Father except through him. Christians believe that Muslims are going to hell. At best, you are not here to talk to us. You just want to convert us. So how was I to respond to this? How do Christians respond to this challenge of exclusivity in the eyes of God? If we believe that Jesus is the only way to God, the only way to the abundant life, is it not our duty out of love and compassion for the other to convince those who do not believe in Jesus that he is the only path to salvation? Are we unfaithful if we do not affirm that John 14 is the ultimate path to truth? This moment offered a real-time application of a core tension at intersections. How can we be both unabashedly multi-faith while still being unapologetically Christian. Now for me, the first step in answering this question lies in the context out of which Intersections was created and in which we undertake our work. 
Like here in Berkeley, the Collegiate Church of New York is located in a place where God's great mosaic is revealed on any given street corner down almost any block. The Collegiate Church lies within the Reformed tradition of Christianity where individuals and faithful communities are challenged to grow where they are planted, to respond to the unfolding realities of history while still holding true to the foundational principles of our faith. Intersection's mandate is to build respectful relations across lines of difference so that together we can forge common ground for justice, reconciliation, and peace. And so we position ourselves at those boundary points, what we call those thin places between soldier and civilian, between Muslim and Jew, between atheist and evangelical, between artist and politician, as we seek to turn those borderlines into intersections. We lead people to unite across lines of difference in mutual pursuit of social justice, both globally and locally. We create safe space at the crossroads of some of our world's most critical conflicts, engaging diverse communities in dialogue, service, advocacy, and artistic expression. Together, we work toward a just world united in diversity. Indeed, we envision a time when our distinct identities no longer form lines of difference that incite division, discrimination, destruction, and despair. We envision a just world, united in diversity, a world in which human differences serve to advance connection, equality, respect, and abundance for all people. Our four interactive programs, four interactive programs, service together, uniting veterans and civilians by building community and providing mutual service to others, arts at the intersection, bringing together artists and activists by transforming conflicts through original theatrical works and providing leadership development to underserved populations, global peacemaking, uniting divided nations and peoples through multicultural, interreligious partnerships that dismantle extremism and facilitate social political and economic equity and believe out loud, joining Christians with LGBTQ justice through an online network that empowers Christians to work for LGBTQ equality, and these programs stand at these intersections, creating safe space for people to come together across lines of difference in diverse and sometimes volatile environments. We work with our participants to discover common ground and pursue justice through dialogue, service, advocacy, and artistic expression. So what, you may ask, makes this distinctly Christian? How do we maintain the discrete traits of our faith while not excluding those who express the concerns raised in that room in Islamabad? How do we love the other? How do we share time, energy, resources with those who differ from us? I offer two stories from scripture that perhaps can help us formulate a response to the culture of scarcity that seems to afflict so many and help us live beyond our parochialism and celebrate the brilliant mosaic of diversity that God has given to us. In Isaiah 43, we read, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. I do, so do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? This portion of Isaiah was written during the final years of the Babylonian exile. It was not a good time for the Hebrew people. Exile is never a good time. Their culture was threatened, their people disheartened, but the author had great faith in God 
as intervening in human affairs. A new exodus will emerge. God will surely restore the Israelites to Judea. Now, the context of salvation in this passage is found in Israel's memory. God's saving grace doesn't just arise out of nowhere. It has a prototype, the exodus from Egypt. The image of slavery to freedom through the experience of wilderness wanderings was seared into the consciousness of the people, shaping their self-understanding, defining their culture. So these verses speak of a new salvation, but one that is clearly rooted in the past. Remember, implies the prophet, the Lord makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, and brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, and so we are called to remember. But, in the very next verse, the prophet proclaims, do not remember. What came before is context, but now is the command. Do not remember. Even the exodus, the prophet is saying, can be idolized. We can be so fixed on our understanding of it that we fail to realize the new signs of life breaking out all around us, qualitatively new challenges and opportunities that lift us out of our past context and cause us to consider our world through a totally new lens. Remember, do not remember, just one single verse apart. The second story is found in Luke's gospel, the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Now, this passage is often humorously told, acted out as children's sermons, bibliodramas, or in church school. I have been in this pageant a number of times, and I always play the same part. I'm the tree. <laughs> Now, this is not a funny story, actually, but it is a surprising and compelling narrative that radically changes directions in two ways. First, as the passage opens, Jesus is clearly passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. Having been there, I can attest that Jericho's landscape is somewhat unforgiving, very rocky with deep ravines. But something while he's there happens. Jesus encounters the despised tax collector Zacchaeus and then proclaims that he must stay at his house. Jesus, on his relentless march to his own destiny, takes time out to change course. Zacchaeus goes on to justify his behavior as a tax collector while the populace grumbles about Jesus' choice of a place to stay. But both the self-justification and the grumbling seem to go unheard. Jesus simply proclaims that salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. What is remarkable is that in the chapter immediately preceding this in Luke's Gospel, Jesus claims that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to get into heaven. And lest we miss the point, Luke tells us that Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector and that he was very rich. These two biblical illustrations challenge us in our context to be both unabashedly Christian and also unapologetically multi-faith as we explore the concept of God's abundance in our world. And it is more than financial resources. It is generosity of spirit, of will, of embracing diversity, knowing that God is in our midst and that it is God's desire that we have life and that we have it abundantly. If we live in a context of abundance and not scarcity, peace will come and justice will be done and in God's time, all will have enough. 
I close with a thought. The meaning of Christianity was pointed out to me not too long ago, and I thought it was one of the most profound things I ever heard. And it went something like this. When you draw a line in the sand and place the other across that line, know that Jesus is also across that line. May we live out our faith each day in God's hope. Amen. Please join me in singing Tuma Mina uh, in your hymnal, uh, New Century Hymnal number 360. Tuma Mina. Tuma Mina, Tuma Mina, Tuma Mina, Somala, Senya Vuma. Senya vuma, senya vuma, senya vuma, so la. Send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Jesus, send me Lord. Lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me Jesus, lead me. Jesus, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Jesus, fill me, Lord. We prayed earlier during confession a series of yeses to God. The offering is a yes to God. It is a yes to spiritual discipline and a yes to practical sustenance of the ministry of the church, but it is also a yes, God, we will obey you, we will respond. And if obedience is too problematic for you, then yes to God's call to pilgrimage, to a quest that is lively, challenging but rewarding and worth taking. So where do we start? How about yes as an acknowledgement that life is a gift? And accepting that gift of life is not simply a transaction between us and God, but a way of seeing the world that can uplift us, energize us, and free us. Ushers, would you please come forward? Thank you. 
for the gift of existence. May we use what we have, may we use ourselves to heal, to grow, to empower, to change, to free. Use us, God. In your name, amen. Amen. Please be seated. All over the world, and just about every time zone on this day, unapologetically Christian people are breaking bread and sharing cups in hopes for a multi-faith world. From Berkeley to Bombay, from Detroit to Damascus, from Tallahassee to Tehran, Christians are breaking bread in hopes of a free and beautiful and accepting world. And this morning we are mindful of these places, places in the heart of the world, places where not much is happening, places where everything seems to be breaking forth, falling apart and coming together. We know that at this table, we receive strength and sustenance, traction in our faith, so that we might go forth wherever we are to be bread for the world, sustenance for those who are hungry, wine, succor for those who are thirsty. May we come to this table this morning with the sacred hope that all will be well, that there will be enough for all. I pray a prayer this morning that comes out of our hymnal It's one of my favorite prayers, and in this prayer we pray for sharing and for abundance in the midst of of our scarcity. Let us pray. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for calling forth the creation and raising us from dust by the breath of your being. We bless you on this day for the bounty and beauty of the earth, and for the vision of the day that you have given us, when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We remember the covenant you made with your people Israel, and we give you thanks for all our ancestors in faith. We rejoice that you call us to reconciliation with you and all people everywhere and that you remain faithful to your covenant, even when we are faithless. We rejoice that you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and blessing, and we remember and celebrate the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent in the fullness of time to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the mystery of your word, to suffer and to die on the cross, and to be raised from death on the third day, and to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church you have gathered, with your sons and your daughters of faith in all places and all times, we pray now together. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we remember on the last night of Jesus' life, knowing that in hours he would be betrayed and arrested. We remember that he gathered with his friends in an upper room in Jerusalem and supped with them, had dinner with them. In the midst of dinner, he took a common piece of bread, and it was probably unleavened, even as this bagel is this morning. And he blessed it, and he broke it, broke it open. 
and gave it to his friends with these words, This is my body. This bread is like my body. Whenever you break bread together, remember me, for I am always with you. In the same way, also, after supper, he took the cup, and he shared that, this with his friends, and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you eat and drink in remembrance of me. And knowing that we live and celebrate the sacrament in full community, this morning we're inviting Matt Boswell to bring bread and cup to our children in church school. And I invite the deacons to come forward for all things are ready. This morning we'll be sharing in healing prayers. As we are taking communion, there will be a person in the front and in the back. And we invite you, as communion is served, to come to the back or to the front of the sanctuary, come from the middle aisle, and then after you have participated in the covenant of communion, please just uh, return to your seats uh, using another way. All things are ready. Ministering to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we give you bread and cup.
Friends, let us pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for uniting us in the blessing of Christ as this meal fills us with joy and hope. Grant that in the days ahead, our lips which have sung your praises may speak the truth. Our eyes which have seen your love may look with compassion on the needs of the world. And our hands which have held this loaf and cup may be active in your service. We pray with gratitude and thanksgiving. Amen. is another moment of transition in our community and this is a beautiful moment and a moment for which I give personal thanks and praise. From seminary student to emerging leader to our young adult ministry coordinator to newly called pastor to White Salmon, Washington, we recognize and give thanks for Kelly. We are so grateful for her ministry with us, for her beautiful presence, for her wonderful voice, for her willingness to speak about justice, truth, and righteousness, and for her willingness to shepherd those pesky young adults. <laughs> we are so grateful, and we want to wish you Godspeed and want to send you forth with our blessing. So I want to invite our staff to gather around, and Jason, if you'd like to come close, Kelly's husband. Let's just put you in the middle and we'll extend our arms to you with a blessing as we send you forth. Kelly is not leaving our congregation. Uh, she'll be ordained here on January 10. Uh, so she'll always be a part of us. This is not goodbye, this is thank you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the life and the breath and the powerful ministry of Kelly Ryan in our midst, for all that she is and for all the gifts that you have given to her, we are so grateful. She has received from you so many blessings and has been so willing to share those blessings and gifts and talents with us. And now we send her forth. We send her forth in your name, with your love, and with your blessing upon her as she begins this new ministry. May you fill her lips with your words. May you fill her heart with your love. May you fill her soul with the mystery and the power of what it means to serve you in such a profound way as pastoring in a local church. And may you always walk with her, even as she walks with you. With our gratitude and our love, we send her forth. Amen. Amen. And now you. 
You are called to go forth. You are called to go forth in Christ's name with the love of God and in the Spirit who calls us ever forward out into the world to minister and to witness and to give God glory. Amen.